Tim's my favourite, I have to say. Because <laughs> 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 he took me out in Amsterdam, you see. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we won't go into that. Which I think you don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was a really good thank you. Right. Good morning. Good morning. So nice you're all here. Thank you very much. So, um, about 18 years ago, I started as a trader, um, pit trader, you know, um, maybe for you that you're, you're quite young, right, so you may not know what I'm talking about, but these guys with colored jackets yelling quotes, if you, you know what I mean, you've seen it on maybe on films or, or you know, like on television. So on my first day I started, I was like coming from university and I had studied about finance and option strategy and all these things. And the first thing my boss told me was to listen, I want you to forget everything you have learned at university. You know nothing. And I was like, okay, you're the boss. And then he said, look, a good trader is a trader that makes money without too much risk. Now, a good trader has, has merely two features. I make it very simple for you. A good trader has two features. One, he doesn't have a big ego. Because ego shows him either becoming fearful or becoming too big for your boots, you call it in English, right? Becoming overconfident. I'm bigger than whatever the market, I'm bigger than gold. If you're too fearful, you're you know you're nervous and you will never be in time to do a trade. If you are too big for your boots, then you drag down not only yourself, but also the company you're working. So ego shows in two ways, being fearful or being too big for your boots. And if you can stand in the middle of those two, then you have the ability, the first ability to make money. Now the second feature of a good trader was, it doesn't matter if you just did your worst or your best trade in your life, there's only the trade to come now. So a good trader doesn't have a big ego and lives in the moment and knows nothing. So that is, you know, that sounds like, like uh, as a material, you know, you go to India and there's this Indian guru and he tells you like, no ego and live in the moment. But I learned this in my first day being a trader in the financial world. Now, um, I'm, I'm not okay with this title, Making Money in the New World, because well, we are going to talk about this, and uh, there's basically three parts. There's three parts in this talk. The first talk, the first part is, is about the past, about my past, but um, it's about the life lessons I've learned as a trader. And you will see that it is a story of personal development, maybe of, of, of spirituality. And I learned that as a trader. So the whole spectrum of what you could call spirituality passed by being a trader. The second part is what banks don't want you to know. And this is how you, um, this is a, a, a talk about, a, a part, a part about, about the, the banks are playing a game and they are taking your money for nothing. It's very simple, but you should know it. So that's the present. And then the future is how the world is changing at this moment. And how you can not only um, help the world further, but also make more money. And this is something that is that, that seems extremely difficult, you know, like um, the world of, you could call it spirituality, or, or you know, like personal development, or helping the world for further, or taking care of each other, and that rotten world of finance and I hope I can show you that you can merge the two so it's funny I was I was waiting in front of the the wrong door I always do that you know I take the wrong train you know like that's that's typically me I was actually wondering also you know like how can you 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 mix these these two worlds you know the money world and the, and the zen world so I was wondering, <coughs> do I do my hair the, the hippie style or do I do, 
So I'm now in in the, in, the, in the making money with with the hair shit like a little bit short like this, but maybe I will uh, change that in a bit. So the the tip of the months, I was waiting in, here in front of the wrong door, and my friend, uh, I have a llama friend, you know, a Tibetan llama, so the monk, not not the animal that's spitting, but the monk, <laughs> and he called me from India with uh, you know all these Tibetan kids around him. You know, like so, so I have a clear connection with Tibetan Buddhism, and their mantra is "All money, <coughs> and if you if you do, they have this. They have to do it like 108 times. You know, they have to, uh, a necklace with beads, and then they grab one bead, and they do 108 times like the money, but the money, but the But if you go really fast in that mantra, it's like all money. <laughs> so that is that is like the goal of this talk to merge those two worlds. Okay. Okay. So three to, uh, three three parts. I just told you that. Um, let's go to the first part. So I just told you that on my first day, I I learned lesson one. You know nothing. Yeah, it's whatever you think you know, if you become a trader, you're always confronted with knowing nothing. And it's a pretty cool way of living, I think. Um, I'm a father of four children. And um, from one of those children, when she was nine, she's 16 now, we were walking in the street and she ordered me to get a hold of her jacket. Hold this. And I was like, uh, why should I hold this? And she <laughs> looked at me and she said, oh my God, Daddy, you really don't understand anything about anything, do you? <laughs> and I was thinking, well, maybe, you know, that's true. Because if you look at Greek <laughs> philosophers like Socrates, right? That's pronounced well, Socrates. He was famous because of the idea that he was the only one in the world that knew he knew nothing, and that made him the most intelligent person in the world. Now, living from knowing nothing makes you energetic, curious, and the opposite of, of like the 50-year-old guy, you know, who is who is knowing everything better than other people. If you live from a know-nothing perspective, you don't do age, gender, color, you know, you don't care. You're always curious, so it gives you like a childish, childish energy. This is uh, this is in the in the crowd. The way it looks. So okay, so knowing nothing, you know that's one thing. Then not a big ego because ego shows in fear or in victory <coughs> boots and living in the moment. Now the, there's a few lessons I've learned in in uh, the trading pit, and I will just you know get along with it and have some stories of how it went and yeah well how it was so one thing so you have to imagine you know let me let me sketch the the situation um, the crowd the trading pit is a group of like 20 to 30 people and they're competing with each other so that means that the, the energy going around there is like 13 year old <coughs> children teasing each other, but then they're working with a lot of money. So it's like a bizarre surrounding <coughs> where whenever you are angry, for example, because something is out of line, there will be 29 people <coughs> trying to make you even more angry. Because one competitor less is more money for the rest. And then if you're, uh, if you're angry and 29 people are like pushing you over, then you get to rule number six. And rule number six, I, do, does anybody know rule number six? Okay, rule, rule number six is about an uh, English uh, prime minister. And he's sitting in uh, the House of Commons, right? And he's talking with a Russian colleague. And uh, they're talking about, you know, politics stuff, stuff I don't matter. And at a certain moment, Peter comes in, one of the servants of the English president. <laughs> and Peter is panicking. 
Um, is the Prime Minister, do you need your hand up? He's panicking. And the Prime Minister is saying, uh, Peter, don't forget room on the six. And Peter is like, oh, thank you. And he calms down immediately. He walks away. And the, the Russian public is already, you know, frowning, like, for what interest. Well, anyway, they go on with the talk, and five minutes later, Marie comes in, completely panicking, same story. And the Prime Minister says again, yeah, uh, Marie, never forget the rule number six. And Marie, she comes down and she walks away, serene like a Tibetan monk. You know, like, like me. she had been meditating for an hour. And the Russian colleague is now, you know, like really interested, so he's, he's like, okay, you know, what is rule number six? And the Prime Minister says, ah, rule number six, well, it's very simple. It is, don't take yourself so bloody seriously. <laughs> Russian colleague is like, oh, hmm, interesting. What are the other rules? There aren't any. So don't take yourself so bloody seriously. And if you think about it, you know, and this is something I learned in the crowd. Whenever I was fed up with something because I was losing money, there were people like literally pushing me, trying to push you over, you know, like, like break you. And what you learn there is, well, don't take yourself so bloody seriously. And when, whenever you think of it, you know, that any negative emotion, and if you think of the idea, don't take yourself so bloody seriously, it's like a no-brainer, you know, you're missing your train, like, oh, I'm too late at work, or whatever. And then, don't take yourself so bloody seriously. Oh, okay, you calm down, you relax, and you take life like this. Now, a, a, a further um, step in not taking yourself so seriously is not taking things personally. What happens in this crowd is people go bankrupt, you know, like when their money is exchanged in a very rapid way, especially, you know, when the, the, the stock market is opening like 10% lower than some people who will who are a millionaire, they're bankrupt and the other way around. Um, what happens if somebody is almost, and I've been here, I will tell you later, if somebody is almost on the, on the edge of being bankrupt, you know, like balancing at the cliff, there are these 29 people doing like, kick, and they kick you over. So in other words, you help somebody to become bankrupt, but then you're lying there, you know, metaphorically, you know, money less and everything. And then somebody says like, hey, come on, you want a job? Yeah, so even though 29 people wish the worst for you money-wise, that once you're lying there, rock bottom, somebody helps you up and gives you another job. And then when you think of it, if you wouldn't, and I know this is, for me this is impossible, but maybe I'm not there yet, if you wouldn't take things personal, you would, if, if you would never take things personal, you'd probably end up being human. I mean, you probably end up you're probably not human because it's maybe impossible to take nothing personally. But if you would be able, like theoretically, you would always live in complete bliss. You know, because whenever we get out of line, we become, you know, like angry, jealous, worried. It's because we are taking things personally. Now, um, I had a, a colleague in, uh, in the crowd, a com competitor colleague, you, you can call it. Because everybody's competing, but you, you are actually, because you see each other in very deep emotions, you know, like losing a lot, becoming depressed, and earning a lot, becoming euphoric. You get to know each other really, really good. You know, so this whole, this whole market thing, it all ended, but all my colleagues from the crowd are spread out, out over the Netherlands doing different things and whenever you meet somebody it's like you're really good friends because you have shared like deep emotions together. And there was one guy, his name is Jaco. And Jaco was a really good and disciplined trader and a good friend of mine, but he was so noisy, like HDHD to the top, you know, just continuously eight hours a day making extreme noise. And I was the one fighting with him every day, you know, every day. But we were also really good friends. So what happened was we're, we're in a fight and this is like we're yelling at each other. 
And then one of us would say in the middle of a fight, hey, coffee. And the other one would say, oh, yeah, sure. And we would walk away, you know. And the people left in the crowd, they were like, these guys are, you know, like, it's crazy. And then one time, he was so noisy. And then afterwards, we were drinking the beer. And I said, like, Jaco, you know, like, today, you know, like, it's, what's wrong with you? You know, like, you're making so much noise. You know, I couldn't stand it today. So I was taking myself too seriously for us here, you're recognizing that. And then Jaco was saying, like, come on, Tim, it's all a mouse. It's all a mouse. I only make noise, like, completely calm, he said. I only make noise because everybody hates it. And, you know, the more noise I make, the more people will leave. It's just taking, I'm putting on my trader mouse. And we were fighting. I had my trader mask on. And then we went for a coffee. We both put our friend mask on. And this is, this is something we all do. You know, I have my speaking in front of public mask on right now. Uh, I have four children. They're 18, 16, 13, and 4. I have my daddy mask. And it's a different mask if I talk to the four-year-old. Like, hey, man, give me high five bucks. But to the, the, the adolescents, I can't do that anymore. They'll be like, OK, weirdo. You know, you're awkward, <laughs> man. Come on, what's wrong with you? And then when you think of it, you know, we, I, I met this guy once, he's, a, he's actually a friend of mine, and he's a, a narcissist, you know, like, his name is Ari, and he's talking about the Ari person, like, not the universe, the Ari first, you know, so he's so self-centered, that he's so narcissistic, and he is telling me, like, oh no, I don't have a mask on, and I'm like, what do you mean? You know, so it's about being conscious. He was, he, this guy is a good friend, but he's so self-centered that he, he claims that he doesn't have a mask on. But if you're not conscious about the fact that you have a mask on, you are having a mask on, right? And um, this having a mask on is, is an interesting fact. You know, there's being the father, being the friend, being the husband or the wife, being with kids, being with older people, you know, we all put different masks on. And it's funny <coughs> if you're aware of that, it doesn't need to control you. So that mask part is a, a face part, a personality thing, a archetype, a ego thing, you would say it. And whenever you put a mask on, like I'm at work and I have my work mask on, and then I go to my children, I put my work mask off and I put my daddy mask on. But in between those two moments, even if it is for a split second, I don't have my mask on. And it's it's the same as, as showering. You know, when you shower, you literally undress and you put off all your masks. And this is why I think showering is, is a really cool meditation where you you are completely maskless. You know? um, so we all put a mask on. I learned this, you know, with my, my over irritating colleague that was so noisy. And when he said it, I was like, "Yeah, okay, you're right." You know? So we're putting a mask on, and as long as you're aware of putting that mask on, it doesn't have to control you. Now, a, um, a other thing that was quite different from other working places, because you know, normally you go to a working place and there is a certain work ethic. And you cannot just you know, express yourself like, like, let me show you, a, this is my son, Liam. Uh, Liam is four. Uh, so I have four kids, a boy of 18, uh, a girl of 16, girl of 13 and a boy of four. And from the older kids, they, you know, they're in their adolescent phase. They teach me to lose my ego over and over and over and over and over again. You know, because I'm a hippie daddy, so they have a big mouth against me. I never, never understand how that, you know, like, I allow a lot and then you get a big mouth back. But, you know, <laughs> that's just a given fact. Um, 
So the older kids teach me to lose my ego, you know, because they're honest, they're on the mirror, they give it to me straight, which I respect most of the time. <laughs> Not always. Um, the four-year-old, he's, you know, like little kids, they're, I think you can learn a lot from children, you know, they're, 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 what you can learn from the little children is they express themselves without any shame. So, if they want help, they ask for help. If they want to give help, they give you help. If they uh, are sad, they are crying, and three minutes later, they're loving again. So they're like a, a clean slate, you call it in English, I think, right? You know, whatever emotion comes, just express, express yourself and, and it's gone. So it's about being empty, basically. And that's, that's something we can learn from our children. And that's something I learned. I, that was uh, one of the nicer things being a trader in the crowd, in the trading pit, is when it's not that busy, you start singing songs with your competitor colleagues, you know, because you're just waiting for something to happen. Um, when you're angry, you can be like, express yourself, big chance that people want to push you over even more, but you are allowed to make noise. You know, and this is something that I, I'm a meditation teacher. I teach every Monday in Amsterdam. I teach meditation. Uh, I meditate every day. I have a new series. Meditating is easy on YouTube. You know, like, I believe in meditation. It's finding some form of silence. And you don't have to, you know, like sit cross legged lotus on, 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 a, on a cushion. You can drive in, in the mountains with your car or, um, I don't know, maybe even pick your nose, you know, like whatever your meditation is. It's finding a form of silence. But what we forget is that the other way around, it's making noise, is actually another way of, of calming the mind. You know? uh, making noise is expressing yourself. And this can be done, you know, like when you're, um, when you're going to, to a concert of your favorite band, for example, and they play your favorite song, and it's loud, the music is loud, and you're singing that song. You're yelling, you know, the lyrics, and that is a moment that you are completely silent. And often we forget this in, in the path of personal development. You know, we um, this is including me. You know, so um, I have a path too. Like six, seven years ago, I thought like, okay, meditating, and I feel this energy, and you know, everything is changing because I turn around what I believe and stuff like that. But then I felt I couldn't express myself that much anymore because you know now I'm that far. You know I can't be uh, crying or being emo emotional or, or anger. No, that's not for me anymore. But by actually not expressing yourself, you're keeping it in. So you need to meditate a lot more. Yeah, so that's, I call this the power of paradox. Actually, so the power of paradox is to calm the mind, find silence. Yes, true make noise also true it's very often it's not neither or but it's and and there are different paths to Rome different paths to a calm mind which is silence and noise both true power of power uh, yeah so this was I was with the four kids in the Philippines um, alone you know like most people thought I was crazy uh, as well in the Netherlands as in the UK as in the Philippines like you're traveling with four children, what's wrong with you? But um, it's actually really nice because uh, the adolescents, they, they take up their own responsibility when you travel alone because, you know, we got to help daddy. And with the four of us, we actually take care of the little one. Uh, it's funny that the, the Philippine families, they all want to invite you over. So this is the moment where, um, where we were in the, in the dive shop and we were going to dive. That's, that's, the hippie education you get if you're my child, you have to become a diver. So the three adolescents that became a, a open water advanced nitrous divers in one holiday. So they, they cannot learn more. The next step is becoming a professional dive master. And one of them is the 13, you know what? But that aside, we were in, in the dive shop. And suddenly it was like, where's Liam? We're like, hmm, oops. And then you, you become like a military thing, you know? like. Uh, like, I'm checking the sea, you know, that's the first thing you do. I'm checking the sea. You stand here, you go there, you go there. 
And we're looking like nobody's floating in the sea. Okay, that's safe. No, okay, cool. He's okay. And looking, where's Liam? Where's Liam? And he was in the massage salon next door, <laughs> lying there with five women around him, touching his foot, massaging him. And like a, he was like a, like a, I don't know, the owner of the place or something. And this is where we took this photo. Of him. Well, okay, that's a yeah, great, a great, um, a great teacher. Now, another thing I learned um, in this training bit was that we often feel that um, we have to compete with other people, right? I mean, um, in business, I have to check out my competitors, but also, you know, like. Oh my God, she has a new hairstyle. Or uh, look, I want that. You know, we're, we're we're comparing ourselves to to other people. Now within that crowd, thirty people, you know, and mean and, and, and teasing each other and pushing each other over and hoping somebody goes bankrupt. Like nasty, nasty business, right? But if you would be there alone, without your competitors, you wouldn't be able to put down prices. So in other words, we often, it, it, it's all about, we often have a certain idea and then power of paradox, the, the opposite may be true as well. Of course, you compete with each other, you know, and we, yes, if you have a business and there's, a, you have a bakery and next door is another bakery, you probably will lose business. So it's not, not true, but it's also true that without that competition, you are nowhere. And this goes for this, this, this trading um, trading pit is basically a metaphor for life. You know, although we feel we want to compete with each other, behind competition is often working together. Like, um, for example, um, Microsoft, and this was two years ago, Microsoft spent 70% of their time looking at what the com competition, Apple, was doing. Apple was working 70% of the time on how can we make our customer experience better. Clearly that Apple does a better way if you focus on working together instead of competing, actually get a lot further. Without your competition, you're nowhere. You may know that, maybe you have like a, a profession that is, you know, with, with a terminology that nobody really understands. And you can also only talk to your, your colleagues or your competitor colleagues, you know. This is why people from, from banks, from different banks, they gather after work and drink and talk with each other because they have nobody else to talk to. All right, so competition doesn't doesn't really exist. And we will get back to this in the third part, by the way. Now, another thing um, I learned the hard way, of course, is that everything is temporal. Uh, and especially in your uh, financial situation when it comes to being a trader. Now, I just told you that the first day, you know, a good trader doesn't have a big ego and lives in the moment. Often we learn lessons, you know, and then you understand them, but they're not integrated yet. So it comes from talking the talk to walking the talk, or walking the walk, how do you call it, walking the walk? And often you have to make a mistake then. So I learned the lessons, no ego, and live in the moment. Now I was um, I was kind of a big trader, you know. Um, I was working in the Royal Dutch Shell option pit, which is the greatest, the biggest um, number of options was was going around there. Uh, I was the biggest trader of Royal Dutch options. That meant I was one of the biggest traders of the Dutch market. And the Dutch market was like the second biggest market after Chicago in the world. So you're already feeling it. I was becoming too big for my boots. You know, I was feeling overconfident, feeling so uh, I mean, like a little hippie guy, you know, because I looked the same, you know, a little less, less wrinkles here, but hair was the same. Um, being the biggest trader, you know, that does something to you, that makes you feel like, whoa, yeah, I'm really cool. And what happens with that? So you're, I was on that, that one side, you know, being, being too big for your boots, being overconfident, 
and then you flip over to the other side and you veer through. So, due to certain circumstances that just happened in life, you know, like uh, I had to rebuild the house and I was busy with that, so I was less focused on my work because I had to do, you know, my ways and things. And this overconfidence flipped to being fearful. And I had six months, in six months' time, I lost all my money, which was 600,000 euros. Uh, so, like 100,000 a month. But you know, this is no story of Ferraris or pink champagne or whatever. You know, like that, that story and, and drugs, of course. You know. um, I was just riding my bicycle, and I had the same hair. You know, like there was, I didn't spend the money; I just lost it. The, and uh, the people in the crowd they called me uh, a hippie trader. You know, so, um, and I was a hippie actually in the market. Because I, uh, I didn't care for, you know, how much money you have or you have, you know, it's like, what are you really saying to me? You know, that, that was more important to me. But I was corrected that not, I'm not a hippie trader, I'm a yippie trader. A yuppie hippie trader, like a hippie with a credit card. <laughs> <laughs> but then six months later, I lost it all. And then, you know, I was, uh, I was a hippie trader. Um, so that was that was like one of the bigger rock bottoms I had in my in my life. It happened around ten years ago, where I seriously lived in complete fear for six months time. You know, like I couldn't sleep. I was drinking every day. I woke up in the middle of the night. I couldn't sleep anymore, or I couldn't fall asleep. Just terrible. The last week I lost a hundred thousand euros, and then it was just gone. So. Um, I remember I was standing in front of my house, like one o'clock, the sun was shining, it was somewhere in June or something, and my biggest nightmare just had become reality. You know, like, I feared to lose all my money, I lost all my money in six months now. Some pretty cool manifestation power over there, you know. And I, I thought it was a really interesting emotion because I lost all my money, my nightmare became reality. But I was standing in front of my house, you know, without a job, like, you're off, you know, you're, you're, you have a holiday for the rest of the year. And my emotion was that I was relieved. And that was really weird. So. I didn't understand it, and I thought, like, what's happening? How come? Like, I felt like I literally had less weight on my shoulders, and it struck me that that being afraid of something, you know, is actually worse than that something might happen. That you can never prepare for the bad stuff to happen. You know, oh, I'm going to lose all my money, or or my granddad is going to die. You know. It is of no use of worrying about the bad things that might happen in the future because you can never prepare. And even maybe that bad thing that might happen is maybe less uh, bad than worrying about it. So there was this, I think it was in some American president, uh, Roosevelt, I believe he said, we only have to fear fear itself, that idea. But then when I think of it, I don't agree with that. We don't only have to fear fear itself. Because it's really, you really have to do your best, you know, to live and really be fearful to, to create what I've created. Because 99% of the fears we have are not coming through. You know, like I'm doing my shopping and I'm hanging that plastic bag on my bicycle and I think, oh, but if it falls, if it breaks, you know, um, maybe. <coughs> stuff like that. Most of the worries we have never become reality. So 99% of the, the, the fears and the worries we have never become reality. So it's it's okay to fear. You know, it's, it's, it's human. It's cool. It's okay to fear, but it's also rather useless. Because 99% of the, of, the, of the worries never become reality. So, uh, yeah, I had to learn that lesson the hard way. 
being overconfident, being fearful is going to cost you your money. Um, and that even if it's okay to worry, it's pretty useless too, because you can never really prepare for the bad stuff to happen. And then the last thing I learned was that there is still enough to be grateful for. Because I tried hard to, to you know, like drinking every day and, and smoking and stuff like that. So I tried hard to, to do bad to my body, but it, I was still healthy. And we had three kids then, and they were also, you know, they were healthy and doing good. And, and my wife didn't leave me. You never know, you know, I cashed all the partner ball. So I learned that although I was, you know, it really does something to you, losing all your money, I learned that there's always something to be grateful for. And I believe that, that that thing, you know, being grateful, because we all have our own story, we all have our losing our money or whatever, you know, and we all have a personal story and an interesting personal story, but whenever there is something happening that is out of line and doesn't feel good, there is always something to be grateful for. And I like the, the most recent example of this is a good friend of mine, she had uh, breast cancer, and she was, you know, like doing chemo and stuff like that. And at a certain moment, she was in the park and she took a deep breath and she cried because she loved to breathe so much, you know. So, and when you're really in a dark situation, then those simple things become really important. So be grateful. Um, yeah, well. Another thing I, I learned um, from viewing other people, because I never, you know, made like millions, like, but I, I know a lot of people who have. I found that uh, people who, and it's really nine out of ten people who've made like really a serious money, um, they don't become happier. In fact, they become unhappier. And it's, it's because along the path that they're making money. They're starting to think either you like me because I make money, even though you're an old friend of mine, and you start to become money mind and paranoid. And the old friend thinks like, screw you, you know, like, I don't like you like this anymore. So a lot of people that have a lot of money are quite lonely. You know, and this is because more owning more stuff doesn't really make you happier. If you have ten houses to take care of. So that, that is, um, more money doesn't make happier, but enough money, you know, more money doesn't make uh, happier, but enough money does make happier. So it's, there's a balance between taking care of yourself and taking care of that part around you. Now, another thing that I learned, I call it the BS meter. The BS meter is, excuse my language, it's a bullshit meter, right? So. What you learn being in the, in, the, in the trading area is that nobody's speaking their private agenda. And if you can read that, then you know, well, it's a bit of a technical story, but you make more money because you know which side somebody is on. So it's about the bullshit, the BS meter is about training your intuition. And if you, you know, it's exactly the same. If somebody is coming to you and you just feel, you know, like, well, there's something more, that's your intuition. So I learned to train my intuition, my BS meter, being a trader. And for me, the, the, if you, you know, if you ask me what is your definition of spirituality, it has nothing to do with angels or tarot cards or uh, singing mantras or whatever. That's, you know, I love that part. Crystals, horoscope, uh, ET life, whatever. I love that part. I call it the mystical world. I will study the rest of my life. Spirituality for me is nothing more than recognizing your intuition and having the guts to follow it. Uh, in business, it's called God feeling. It's exactly the same. So you don't necessarily have to do meditation or do yoga or hum or um, um, uh, have uh, like certain mudras in your hands to be be spiritual my definition, just being intuitive. 
And a lot of people, you know, like in, uh, in the corporate world are highly intuitive, so very spiritual. So we're all working on that same part. And then, um, so after I lost all that money, I went to work in a completely different area. So I was the pit trader, you know, like, like yelling and calculating fast and reacting fast. And I went to a, a kind of cyber uh, environment with a PhD in math and physics and AI and computer science and stuff like that. Um, it was, um, you call it algorithm trading black box trading, basically where the computer does all the work. Um, so we were trading Asia, Hong Kong, Korea, Japan, Singapore. It's about a bit of India also. Um, in the morning you wake up and you log on to the mainframe and you see what last night did. You know, so completely automated, total cyber, cyber world. I learned a lot there, but there's one thing that is, that, that, that is, I think, the most important, which is the balance between intuition and rational thinking. Now first, about real life, you know, if, you're, if you follow your heart, following your heart is being intuitive, intuition is thinking with your heart. If you follow your heart, you cannot go wrong, right? But you never know if this is my heart talking to me now, or if it's my brain. So even though, you know, follow your heart, you'll be fine. But your brain can be disguised as your heart, and your heart can be disguised as your brain. So we screwed it. <laughs> so it's, it's a balance. It's, it's again the power of paradox. It's both true. Should you be intuitive? Yes. Should you think? Yes, also. Or company. So what we did, as, uh, this, this was like a little, it was a Swiss company, but we were uh, working in Amsterdam, a little research team, four or five, uh, six people maximum. And uh, three of us were partners, and we were making the new algorithm. So we went into the intuitive phase, the design phase, the creative phase, which was whiteboard, three days of fighting. <laughs> You know, because everybody has an ego and thinking that it does better. And those, those, those people, you know, like, I, I don't want to like those people. That sounds like pointing the finger. I learned so much from my nerdy colleagues. And they're also quite difficult to work with, you know, when it comes to an emotional level. I had one colleague, Monday morning, he came like this. He was sitting like this. And you knew, like, oops. You know, wh whatever somebody is saying, within an hour he runs off home because he's had it. He was looking for it, and somebody said something like, ah, I've had it here, and he starts yelling and being angry, and he's like, I'm going home, work from home. You know, like, like sensitive. So we were fighting when we were designing. The intuitive stage was to fight. It's to fight with you. And then we had like a new algorithm, a new formula. And then they were programming it back to mind, you know, in rational thinking, program, programming a program. And then I was like the cook, I got the program and I was making the models. And sometimes we had this great idea on the whiteboard, creative and, and intuitive and intelligent and sophisticated and whatever words we used. But then you look, you're, you're starting to test your system on past data. It's like, like being really rational. You have numbers, you know, that, that have been traded in the past. You use that data to see if your model was, would have been making money. And sometimes it just didn't. So even though you have this intuitive thing and you know this is the right way, you test it with past data and nothing comes out of it. So it can be that either it was your mind being um, um, disguised as your intuition. It wasn't at the right time yet, or whatever. If you're only intuitive, you start like floating around like a balloon without. If you're only rational, life becomes boring because you don't have any dreams anymore. So the the, the balance between intuition and, and thinking, mind and heart, is is something that I learned in my last year. I 
and um, I've made a little list. So if you want, you can, I don't know, maybe you want to make like a photo. So it's, it's like a little summary. You know, read a blank page, you do nothing. Having a small ego, living in the moment. Don't take yourself so bloody seriously. Don't take it personal. Having a mask on and being aware of that mask. Expressing yourself, important. We're all one, eventually, you know, like, as that crowd, you, you form the market together, so you're, you're a, you know, like, we are a little greater in the big machine called the universe. And it's a metaphor of trading, it's exactly the same story. Everything is temporal, but it's time out. Then the balance between intuition and ration. And then the, month, the, the, the lessons I've learned from, from losing my money is you can never prepare for the bad. Fear is human. I just typed this. It was still in Dutch. I just typed this. 90% of the fears never come true. And there's always something to be grateful for. Yeah, so um, actually this talk is a lot of information, you know, like normally I have like exercises and uh, things. Like, can you put yours in your um, the, Actually the other workshop that I'm doing, I'm here tomorrow, not here, but in South End on Sea, which is London East. <laughs> I just take trains and never really map. This is South of London, right? Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. Ah, okay, yeah. Okay. Now I understand Cambridge. Yeah. That's also yeah. Normal. Okay, slow. Um, so, um, this, this talk is a lot of information, you know. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, but there's like no exercises you can do when you talk about money, you know. It's, it's, it's a boring subject. Because normally I, uh, I, I have a lot of uh, exercises and, and my other workshop that I'm doing tomorrow, it's like a four hour training, it's called Body Zen. And Body Zen is a holistic detox method. It's basically uh, the last 10 years, my body has become 10 years younger instead of 10 years older. And that is not due to heavy weight training and you know, like spending hours at the gym. It's a really simple concept. Of, of light exercise, so so that's what I'm doing tomorrow. You can find also YouTube vids about it, videos about it if you like. So, how do you measure that? How do you measure that? How do I measure what? How do you measure You just said that your body's like 10 years younger. How have you measured that? Or is that um, perception? 
Well, it, um, it's it's a definitely a perception because yeah, I wouldn't know how to really measure that, but no, yeah, it's it's more about you know energy, uh, optimal weight, um, and weight is not that important. It's more about energy, like like weight is a it comes automatically with if your energy balance is okay, you will become a bit. Bigger if you're too thin, and a bit smaller if you're a bit too big. You know, so it's not about dieting, or, or it's actually a, I believe in detox, retox. You know, we all know how important to detox is, but we forget that we're retoxing all the time. Coffee, oh, it's tea. No. <laughs> yeah, but it's English tea. <laughs> okay, well, that's good. So, so retoxing is about, you know, either we subconsciously retox because we're living in a, a country where the air and, and the water could be cleaner, for example. Um, but we also uh, consciously retox because sometimes I do that. I go out with my friends and there's like bottles of wine on the table. We, you know, like, so it's, it's okay to retox as long as you know how to detox. And one of the things in that in that um, uh, training is the Wim Hof method. Have you have you heard of that? Um, and Wim Hof is that guy. He's he's from Holland, and uh, he's called the Ice Man. He's he's like world famous. The last year he has been at Oprah and in the United States. You know, like all these famous actors. He's training. Sorry. Yeah, it's it's three things. It's mindset, you know, meditation and some exercises. It's a breathing method, and that breathing method puts more oxygen into your body and thus alkalizes your body. Bing! You know, like alkalizing your body is a problem. You know, you should be all like, oh, alkalizing your body. And by breathing, so not by food, water, nutrition, green powders, you know, just by breathing. You have your breath with you all the time. So it's really interesting. And uh, the third part of that, of that method is taking ice bath or cold training. Which can be, you know, like showering cold uh, to start with. And eventually, if you go to a Wim Hof method workshop, and I just became a teacher in this, an instructor, you will learn the science. It's all backed up by science. There's like five hospitals measuring everything, you know, and like there's so many uh, science about it. So it's, it, it is uh, satisfying the mind, you know, like, oh, this is really true. Um, you will learn the breathing. And in the end of the day, you will go into that ice bath. Mm -hmm. So basically, normally my, my thoughts are, you know, there's a lot of things to do, but that just doesn't fit in this in this talk so much. So, well, you know, like, uh, if you're yawning, I know you're just putting extra oxygen into your body, and I want to take it personal, <laughs> because I'm not taking myself so seriously, even though I'm wearing my mask. <laughs> So what the banks don't want you to know, there's two parts here, there's to invest and, and professional trading. Is there anybody in professional trading or interested in that professional trading part? Yeah? Um, it's not the largest part, so I will focus a bit on investments. So investments <laughs> is you want to put away money for your pension, for when you grow old, or you want to save for the university if you're child or whatever, right? And professional trading is when you're professional, when you're behind the screen and trading and having a strategy like, like my old job, you know, like my past life. So about investment. important thing okay that doesn't work Hello. the most important thing that the bank doesn't want you to know is to keep your costs low to have like a really simple example if you have 50,000 pounds you put it away for 30 years at 7% uh, return and you have half percent of uh, cost uh, it will be something like 400, 450,000. If you make 7%, but you have 2% cost, 
like the average cost of the banks. You make from 50,000 to 150,000. So it's times two, three. So how do you keep your costs low? This is, first of all, the bank, they are pretending they know more than you. And we will get back to this, this in a little bit. But they just, you know, they have as a highest goal of making money, and that is your money. So they want to make as much money without you noticing it. And even though uh, they, the employer at the bank is super authentic, this is because he's trained inside the bank. He gets biased information. So the story that the banks are telling you is that they know better than you do. Now it's, you know, there's certain things you can do to keep your costs low. It is about doing it yourself, you know? And then, um, yeah, there's two types of, of investing. It's top down and bottom up. So the top down is basically, I like the internet. I'm gonna invest in all the companies that have something to do with the internet. Yeah, so top down. Bottom up is, you know this guy, Elon Musk, you know him? Yeah, he inspires me. He's the owner of, or the, the, the founder of uh, Tesla, the car, uh, SpaceX, the company that is sending rockets into the, into the atmosphere, and also Solar City, which is solar power. Elon Musk, he has a higher goal. He says that I want to have the whole economy in the world on non fossil fuel. So, wind, uh, solar, or whatever. That's his higher goal. I love this guy. What companies does he have? Oh, he has these companies. Okay, I'm going to invest in, you know, like, I love Tesla cars, so I'm going to invest in Tesla. That's bottom up. So you find what you love. Now, I think it's one, one very big drawback of giving your money to the bank is that you don't know what you invest in. Um, and the bank employee will be like, yeah, no, but we have this, you know, like, it's a beautiful, it's a, a basket of different stocks and, and, and it brings a, a good return and based on average and blah, 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 you don't know what you own. So maybe, you know, you don't want to invest in weapon industry, tobacco industry, uh, Monsanto, maybe, uh, uh, you know, like oil companies that are making the earth, uh, depleting the earth, maybe you don't want to invest in that. If you give your money to the bank, they will just put it in the whole thing. And, and there was a story once, this was here in England, a, a charity that was very much against smoking, it was one of their, their, their pillars, you know, like we want, you know, the, the whole of the UK of the cigarettes, but on the, in the back, they were investing in tobacco companies because it just makes a big return. How ridiculous is that, you know? Like, so I think it's important that you know what you own. You don't necessarily have to have this, this, this basket of, of, of stocks, but you pick a few where you, you really love, you know? Like, another thing is that if you are an investor, you invest long term. Yeah, you want to keep your costs low, means you buy something to keep. It's very simple, because you're not a trader. And this is, you know, especially guys have this problem. Um, you think you can read the market and uh, I have this Tesla stock and I'm making good money, I'm selling the half and then one month from now it's probably lower and I buy them back. Don't do that. You're not a trader. Keep your costs low, buy to keep. So only long term. And then, yeah, this, uh, you know, it, I, I'm saying this already. Don't become uh, friends with the bank employee because you hear this a lot of time. And I'm always asked this question because I'm a trader and I'm in the financial world or, you know, this is like a true specialism. I know everything about the economy and, and numbers and, and stuff like that. And often older people, they're 65 and they're saved, you know, like enough. They never have to work again. <coughs> They reach their pension age, they stop working, and then they become friends with the bank employee. And it's remembering, you know, the, the, the birthdays of, of, of uh, his grandchildren, for example. He's a, uh, such a nice guy. 
adult. This doesn't work. And it's not that that guy at the bank is not authentic. He's just raised with biased information. Because the banks think they know better. This, this employee thinks he knows better, but he doesn't. And the number one goal of, of a bank is to make money. And also, um, some products are like a guarantee product and, you know, like a beautiful story. But there's one basic thing, the more blurry it is, the more money it will cost you. You know, there were certain financial products that were designed for the public. And it took like 10 to 15% per year of the, uh, the money. You know, it's that the costs were 10 to 15% just because it was blurry. So you probably have heard of um, you know the movie, I'm not sure if you can hear this, but you know the movie The Wolf of Wall Street, right? We think, wow, that's the United States. It's not that there's something really very, very true in this movie. This is a little piece that I have for you here. And it's, it's the part where uh, Hannah is talking to uh, What's his name? Justin? <laughs> well, whatever. Um, okay, so, but I don't have a um, central speaker, so besides the maybe we can hear it. Walk down sideways with the circles, you know, the gas gas. Okay, it's a fake. F, it's a gas, it's a was, it's a was, it's a fee, very dumb. sideways or in circles. And that is the truth. The truth. And the bank, they want to give you this idea, you know, that with, with a nice suit and with, with a big car, they know better than you do. They don't. Nobody knows. And this is actually, this is like the, what is wrong with the financial world? Because I like to make it simple. Money is nothing wrong. There's nothing wrong with money. It's just energy exchange. You know, like you give me a massage and I give you money, or uh, you buy my breath and you give me money. You know, like it's really simple. But where it goes wrong in the financial world is where people make money only one way. So um, you give me your money, I invest. If I do good, I get a really big bonus. If I lose all your money, I don't pay. That's bias. That is, you know, like mathematically, that that will never give you a optimal decision. So where people are making money off people's other money without the downside risk, they are going to take more risk than you should do for yourself. Like all the um, people <coughs> that make money in, in the exchange, they don't put money in the stock market. They buy a house. You know, so the professionals don't put their money or not a lot, maybe 10 or 20% in the stock market. You know, like they buy houses. So that is like the that is the biggest problem in in the financial world is where people make money on your money but don't pay when they're doing the wrong. The, the worst thing that can happen is losing a job. So in other words, the way to make money is to do it yourself and to keep your costs as low as possible. Um, yeah, so do it yourself. Then there's bottom up, top down. Now it takes, if, if, you, if you go from bottom up, by the way, I, can, I will send you this, you can make photos. But if you, um, I can send you, if you want to leave your email uh, in my phone after this, then I can send you the, um, all these uh, slides, you know, so. Uh, bottom up, top down, you know, um, uh, bottom up is find that those companies that you, that you love, basically. It may take some time, so until that, you know, like if you have like a lot of money to invest now, you might want to choose for top down until you find your bottom up. And then 
you know, I have a friend, uh, he, he started investing in Apple because he loved the Apple computer and every year a few thousand and he made so much money on it because he just loved the company. And now he got out because he thinks now Apple is doing like Microsoft business. So he's like, okay, I don't love them anymore, you know, I'm breaking the relationship. So he sold all this stuff. So that's, that's what really works. Uh, don't trade too much, like buy to keep, you know. Uh, love your company and know what you own, you know. Like if you know what you own, you, it gives you, actually it gives you a lot of energy if you know what you own. Right, there are also alternative investments. Um, like for currencies, there's a lot of cryptocurrencies now. You know, the existence of cryptocurrencies is because we don't trust the British pound, the euro and the US dollar anymore. So we're going to another system where cryptocurrencies are, you know, they're not managed by a central bank or by a, a government that just prints more money. There's a certain set of money. It's way more money. So that is the thing that is growing in the future. And I think that all the currencies will eventually be, be uh, cryptocurrencies will take a while. Um, crowdfunding is a very interesting uh, thing because what happens if you crowdfund, you know what you own. So you're an investor, right? And somebody makes like uh, veggie pizzas and you're like, I like that, you know, I love, I'm, 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 a, uh, I'm vegan and, and I like these pizzas, so yes, you know, I want to invest in that. You know what you own. And the, the risk is the same as the normal stock market, like the FTSE 100 is, is one of your baskets of, of, of stocks. But the, um, the return is a lot higher. Plus, <coughs> you're helping young companies to grow, you know, instead of the game that is played now by the financial world, is only the big companies get money, but the young entrepreneurs, they, they don't. So I think crowdfunding is, is really nice. And to invest in dreams, you know, and investing in dreams can be helping your neighbor, for example, that uh, is an artist and he's, he wants to make a gallery and you have the money and he has the you love his work, you know, you can help somebody else. But you can also invest in your own dreams. You know, like doing a course of personal development and start uh, doing sports or whatever. It can be anything. Uh, Warren Buffett, I found this later. I have a certain philosophy about uh, investing. And Warren Buffett, the big guy, he, he thinks exactly the same. You know, like buy a stock the way you would buy a house. So not just, you know, like, I'll buy it so tomorrow. It doesn't work with houses. Understand it and like it, know what you own, love the company. And that you be happy to hold on to it even if there wouldn't be a market. So what stocks would you want if the markets would close for the next five years? Yeah, for long term things. It's a good question. A uh, little summary. Love titles in it today. All right, then very short about professional trading. Oh, sorry, did you want to make a photo? So very short about professional trading. Um, one thing that is also true for professional trading is to keep your costs low. So if you, you know, one thing if you're a professional trader, you have to learn to to sit on your hands, you can call that med meditating. You know? Sit on your hands and not immediately react to everything, but first you know, and you wait, and yes, this is the trade. You know? So keeping your costs low is also for a professional trade is very, very interesting. Then we talked about the balance between intuition and, and, and being rational. Intuition, this is just my philosophy, intuition gives you a long term goal. You know, like, I'm going here to the right. I don't know why, I just have to go to the right. But long term, you will profit from it because you meet somebody and, and, and five years later, you're working together or whatever, you know? So in, intuition sets out the long term path. But you need your mind to, to, um, to trade the strategy. So from that intuition, you, you, you make a strategy and you create a rule book. And this is really important because when you start trading, your emotions are going to take over for sure. It, it, I, I read another day that 
if a man is talking to a beautiful woman, his IQ drops with 30 points. <laughs> this is, you know, like, when you, now you understand why, why guys are sometimes, you know, they are not that stupid. It's just momentarily, you know, they're like, uh, uh, stuttering, whatever. The same goes when you start trading, you know, if it's suddenly you're plus 500 or 1,000 in one hour, you're like, oh, I feel so good. And if you're a minus, you feel really depressed. So it does a lot to your system. So you need rules. So from that intuitive strategy, you're creating a rule book and you stick to the rules. That is important. Knowing nothing is more ego. Part three, the world is changing. Um, I've said it a few times, uh, the power of paradox, the balance between intuition and, and being rational. Now, I've, uh, I'm always very positive about how the world is changing because I believe that humanity is waking up. And there's a difference between an old school company, like a typical oil company or whatever, and new 21st century companies. Also, the big difference is old school companies, they could profit as high as well. If you do that, you're starting to miss me through advertisement or have a front office that is selling, selling crap and leave the crap to be solved by the back office, you know, like, you're, you're lied to, because the only goal of this company is to make as much money for their stockholders. Boring. Uh, the world is waking up, people are waking up, and they're voting with their wallet. So, you know, if you don't like that company, that supermarket, because, you know, they, they're selling crap, you will go to the little places, because, you know, you don't want to fund that anymore. You don't want to sponsor that anymore. Now I will uh, tell you in a little bit the, the, the difference between the, a, a, a old school and a 21st century company. It's a bit of startup thinking. It's, I think it's really interesting. I'm also starting a startup by the way. I'm making a new company. You know. But first I want to um, show you a little piece of this talk. And I um, this is from the movie A Beautiful Mind. Have you seen that maybe? It's about John Nash. And John Nash is a mathematician. Uh, he died two years ago together with his wife, you know, but he's like on the same level as Einstein and Nikola Tesla, you know, like really, really bright. And he became famous with um, something that is called Prisoner's Dilemma in game theory. And I'm not sure if you can hear it, um, but let's try, okay? Because, uh, well, I will explain it afterwards if you can't hear it. Incoming gentlemen. Deep breaths. Nash, you might want to stop shuffling your papers for five seconds. I will not buy you gentlemen beer. Oh, well, we're not here for beer, my friend. Feel she should be moving in slow motion. Uh, <laughs> will she want a large wedding, you think? Should we say swords, gentlemen? Pistols at dawn? Have you remembered nothing? Recall the lessons of Adam Smith, the father of modern economics. In, uh, in competition, individual, individual ambition, ambition serves, serves the, the common, common good. good. Exactly. <laughs> Every man for himself, gentlemen. Yeah, and those who strike out are stuck with their friends. Well, I'm not gonna strike out. You can lead a blonde to water, but you can't make a drink. I don't think he said that. All right, nobody move. She's looking over at him. Why is she looking at Nash? Oh, God. All right, he may have the upper hand now, but wait until he opens his mouth. <laughs> <laughs> remember the last time? Oh, yeah, that was one of the history books. <laughs> yeah. Adam Smith needs revision. What are you talking about? We all go for the blonde. We block each other. Not a single one of us is going to get her. So then we go for her friends. But they will all give us the cold shoulder because nobody likes to be second choice. But what if no one goes for the blonde? We don't get in each other's way. 
and we don't insult the other girls. That's the only way we win. That's the only way we all get laid. <laughs> Adam Smith said, the best result comes from everyone in the group doing what's best for himself, right? That's what he said, that's right? Incomplete, incomplete, okay? Because the best result would come from everyone in the group doing what's best for himself and the group. Ash, this is some way for you to get the blonde on your own. You can go to hell. Governing Let's dynamics, see. gentlemen. Governing dynamics, Adam Smith. What's wrong? Thank you. <laughs> Let me explain it a little bit. <coughs> so, Adam Smith is the founder of our classical economic theory. And he came with a theory based on certain assumptions, you know, prerequisites, you call it maybe. Um, that according, if you, if you stick to those assumptions, it's best to optimize what is best for you and to not have a look at the group you're living in or whatever. So, an egoistic decision is the most optimal decision. That's what he said. This guy is like 1870, he's speaking 1870. So, almost 250 years. This is, the, the, this is what, what people in the financial world say. Like, yeah, but it's okay, you know, Adam Smith, you take care of yourself and the invisible hand will take care of the rest. But the funny thing is that if, if you think about science, you know, like science, you have assumptions, or you have something you want to, you want to, um, from the real world, and you want to do a prediction about that. So you, you create certain assumptions, you know, like um, for this model, we're going to say like this is and this is true. And then you get some result, and then you check if your assumptions hold in the real world, and if not, this model says nothing about real life. But it's exactly what the model of Adam Smith, it says nothing about real life because in real life we don't meet those assumptions, like assumptions like 